morning, church. Good morning. Blessing to be here. Finally made it. <laughs> Since I became the college minister with Tom in commerce, uh, it's my first time being invited here to Grace and Church of Christ. So it's a pleasure to see your faces finally. Uh, you've been great and faithful supporters, so we really uh, thank you for your support in all these years. And today I would like to talk about the, the fight that humans have had since the very beginning, and that is seduction. And we, can, we know that, let's see, that Adam and Eve, the first time that they encounter Satan and they uh, had a conversation with Satan, the first thing that came up is seduction. <coughs> Satan seducing Eve and deceiving her. And seduction is not other thing that a mental coercive manipulation that sedu brings us to the other side. So in this case, Eve, who was on God's side, became friends with Satan because he, she decided to uh, give in to what Satan offered instead of what God had to offer. God had to offer all this fruit and all these uh, vegetables that were in the, tree, in the garden of Eden, but Satan only had one tree to offer, and that was the tree God said not to eat from, and that was the very the very tree that Eve and Adam decided to take in. So it's not, we can see throughout the entire Bible that when seduction, it's a very old friend or a very old enemy of humanity. An old friend, if you decide to follow the world and Satan, an old enemy, if you decide to follow Jesus. So uh, today I want to talk about someone who is not very popular in the church. We don't like him very much. His name is Herod. And Herod is a patriarch. He is going to rule in, in parts of uh, Galilee. And he is the same guy that is going to approve uh, for Jesus to be hanged on the cross. Basically, he made ties with Pilate. To, they both agree that it's okay, it's not on us. His blood is not on our heads. He, if the religious leader want to crucify him, that's okay with us. So Herod is going to have a birthday. And we all like birthdays, right? I'm sure you've, least, you've heard or met friends in the past that say, no, I don't, I don't celebrate birthdays. Those, those are pagan traditions. I like to celebrate my children's birthday and my, my, my wife's birthday is coming up next week. And it's, I think it's a fun time to celebrate and, and be with family. Well, in this context, in back then, it's, it's a little different uh, flavor to it. The flavor to it is that Herod is going to invite all his officers and people in, that, he, that helped him rule over Galilee and he's going to have this big party, like a bachelorette kind of party, when only men come in. And there is just one guest, and it's uh, Herodias, which is his brother's wife. But he decided to marry his brother's wife. And John the Baptist was against that. And he said, hey, it's not, good, it's not right for you to marry and be with your brother's wife. And he, of course, the first one to oppose John the Baptist is Herodias. Herodias finds John the Baptist as a main threat for, his, for her interests. And Herodias <coughs> has a daughter. It's a young daughter. We don't know how beautiful she might be, but she's going to perform a dance during the birthday party. And this birthday party is being witnessed by all these other men. And they are all encircling and enjoying this dance. But when I say the Herodias' daughter is Salome. Salome, there are two Salomes, the good one and the bad one. Salome, uh, Herodias' daughter, is going to be the one seducing Herod and basically playing the role on making the call to behead John the Baptist. The other Salome is a good Salome. She is a follower of Jesus. And she is going to also be the mother of John and James, so two of the main, two of the apostles. So uh, in Mark six, chapter chapter six, 
if you read from verse 14 through 29, that's where you will read this story. And I'm sure you all read the story. Or if you ever watch a, G, a, a Jesus movie on any of the movies, most of the time they will show this episode. And in this episode, you find that Herod feared John. This is John the Baptist, in verse 20, knowing that he was a just... Oh, there it is, the screen. I keep turning back, and I... It's right here. <laughs> so uh, Herod, uh, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe, when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. So we find one thing about Herod, is that he, he knows who John the Baptist is. He acknowledges that God is with him. He acknowledges that he is a man who fears God, that he comes from God. But at the same time, he doesn't like him that much. Why? Because John is calling him to repent from things that he likes, such as being with his brother's wife. So one thing about Herod is that he has ears but could not hear. And he was a listener, but not a doer. And that happens to all of us. Sometimes we like to antagonize Herod as someone who is so evil and so different from us. But if we really funnel down the root of his decisions is that he had ears, just like all of us. But there are things that he didn't like to hear. There are things that just didn't go with his uh, uh, ideals and, and pleasures, such as that. So he was a good listener. He maybe even attended John the Baptist on Sunday mornings and sat there just to be liked by the people. Oh, look, Herod, he comes to uh, Sunday morning assemblies and just to be liked by people, to be approved by people. And that's the very thing that is going to cause him to fall in behaving John the Baptist because he made a commitment in his birthday when Salome came forward, may perform the dance, maybe a 30 minute dance, an hour dance at the most, I don't know. And what he's going to say, he was so pleased by her dance that he said, you know, ask me whatever you want even if it's half of my kingdom, and I will give it to you. And that's when Salome is going to Herodias, her mother, to ask for advice. And Herodias is going to tell her that ask for John the Baptist's head. And that's when he heard this, he was so sad. But at the same time, he made a commitment. Everybody in the room heard him say, I will give you even half of my kingdom. If he doesn't fulfill his word, he is not, he doesn't deserve to be in the place he's in. So he's going to fulfill his word and try to be a man of his word, not a man of God's word. So Mark 6, 16 said, but when Herod heard of it, he said, John, who I beheaded has been raised. This is when he heard about Jesus. And he, you know, it's in his conscience, in the back, it's a back noise in his life from that point forward that he's going to carry with John the Baptist's death and his blood. Herod Antipas' interest, he shows woman's mystery, Salome, and he beheaded God's mystery, John the Baptist, who is going to proclaim and prepare the way for Jesus the Messiah. So that what he shows is woman's, the woman's mystery. And when I mean woman, in this case, the root of this is seduction. She shows seduction, just like Eve, just like any other scene. It's not that women are evil. Women are not evil more than men or men more than women. It's just that in this case, in this particular case, that woman was used in the, uh, for, by Satan to seduce Herod. And, and that is the, the very threat that we find constantly in our... Oh, okay. So in the very thread that we all constantly find in seduction, and Herod chose seduction versus the gospel. And John the Baptist, who was proclaiming Jesus, the Messiah. And if you, ever, uh, if you have ever been in a, in a TV or something, or you're aware of belly dancing, the part of the mystery there, and it's been a really long history for this dancing, is that there is always veils throughout the entire body. There are veils covering 
parts of the body and then sometimes uncovering other parts of the body so that you are always lured and enticed by what is behind the veil. And it's always been very effective and in the way that humans and our flesh works. What is beyond there? You know, you, are, you have Eve in the Garden of Eden with all these trees, pe pe pears, apples, everything 100% organic. And, and then you find this one tree that don't, you don't know where it's going to lead you. God told you that you are going to die. That's the end. They, don't, they didn't know about sin and the law and disobedience and all of that. They just knew if you eat of this tree, it means death. And it, they didn't care for how much they could explore. Even today, you have biologists. I work in, with college students. And they have books over books over books about biology. They could have dive into all the nature that God had placed in their midst, but no, they chose to go there where, what is beyond that veil? What is beyond that, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I am curious, curiosity. And, and there you have it. And part of the mystery in God's word, there is also a mystery in, in the God's, in God's side. The mystery is Jesus Christ. The mystery of the ages that the prophets didn't, were trying to understand is, who is this Messiah? Who is this servant and king? Who is this who is going to crucify, but at the same time be ruled for eternity? Who is this? Who, who, who are we? We will love to know who is this Messiah. That's the mystery hidden for, the, by, by so, for so long and now revealed in this time through the gospel. So, those veils that were in the Old Testament have been removed completely so that we could see that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is the one who can wash away our sins and give us a new life. Colossians 1, 26 through 27, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed by, to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is not just that Christ is the Savior, but that Christ wants to be your Savior, that Christ wants to be inside of you, in you, and, to, and He wants you to have hope in this life. And imagine Herod didn't have any more hope beyond his kingdom. But John the Baptist, before he died, one thing he, he asked is, he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, Are you the one to come? Are you the one we're waiting for? He was almost about to die, and he knew that he had been preaching this message. You know that his ministry was only a six-month-old ministry? I've been in uh, full-time uh, ministry for, since 2016. That's over, se over seven years. And... John the Baptist's ministry was six months. That was, that was uh, a very short ministry, and, but it was a very loud ministry. He was in the, in the Jordan River baptizing people, proclaiming, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So his ministry was short, but, very, but with so much content. And when, he was, when Jesus heard this question, he performed so many miracles in the in the in the eyes of the, the John the Baptist with uh, disciples, and he said, "Go and go and tell John that the, the the sick are healed, that the blind see, that the crippled walk, that the dead are being raised, that the poor at least hear good news." And they went back, and now he was satisfied because he knew that his hope in Christ Jesus was right. And now, after he was beheaded, he knew that was not the end. That was just the beginning of uh, eternity. So Luke 23, 11 to 12. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. This is uh, Jesus. When arraying him in a splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. You know what unified them and made them friends? To be enemies of Christ, to crucify Jesus. So Luke 6, 23 says, And he vowed to her, this is, John, this is Herod, 
Whatever you ask me, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. So Herod and Pippa's commitment was with his, with his word and not with God's word. He turned away from God in Luke 6, 26. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oath and his guest, he did not want to break his word to her. So another thing is he feared men. Herod feared men, and, but didn't fear God. He mocked God, actually. We just read that, that when Jesus was about to be crucified, he even mocked Jesus. So he mocked Jesus, but he feared men. And that's one of the things that we also face in this world, that men we can see, God we cannot see. And so many more times we fear what we see than what we can see, right? But in, as you know, the things that we can see that can be even more threatening to the world than the things that we can see. How many people can see a gun in one building? But plus, how many people in the world could see COVID? COVID, in a way, is invisible from just the normal sight, right? You needed some technology to see it but it kills so many people in the world. So, of course, God is someone we can't see, but he has the power over our soul to either put it in heaven or in hell. So, God, of course, is uh, more powerful than man. His weaknesses are more powerful than the strengths of man. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, John Herod, he's uh, used to ha having soldiers, people who are powerful, who show uh, fear, to, who show that they are capable of conquering kingdoms and so on. When he sees Jesus coming with, you know, someone, uh, a king, but humble and not, uh, he didn't care much for the kingdoms of the world. Even there was a time when the people wanted to make him king. And he refused and went away from them. So Jesus didn't want to be a king, an earthly king. He didn't want to be a powerful uh, man on earth in the sense of conquering kingdoms. And there was one time, one time, and this is the temptation in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, when he prays, Lord, may your, Father, may your will be done, not mine. But he prayed, let this cup pass from me. But the cup that he's referring to is the very time when the soldiers came to find him with Judah, and Judah gave him a kiss to spot him so that the soldiers can come and trap him. He, he told Peter, should, Peter had a sword, and he is about to use it, and he said, you don't know that I can even call you know, a legion of angels, thousands of angels, to come here and fight for me. This was an Armageddon, a, 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 a war. And that was the very moment that he was tempted to, uh, that was the cop that, that he was tempted to use. That is calling all these angels to fight for him, to use violence, to, to deliver him from, the, from death. But instead, he chose to die for us so that we can enjoy peace with him. So how many times we give preference to the power of this world over the power of God? And we know Jesus declined the power of this world. When he, after he fasted for 40 days, Satan came to him and offered him kingdoms and offered him uh, power. And he turned them down because he knew that the power in glory in heaven with the Father is even more valuable. But again... It's always a matter of deciding between the seduction of the world and the gospel. And the world is constantly seducing us. Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. So this is the part when he is going to crucify Jesus. In 6.22, For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. So Herod's and Pippa's pleasure, he gave himself to pleasure and abstained himself from God. So we find uh, a few uh, patterns of Herod, and that is that he feared man rather than God, 
that he uh, seek for fleshly pleasure, worldly pleasures rather than God. And the pleasure of the eyes has more power to move earthly powers than the words of truth coming from God. You see, the, he, Herod, and the, and the political leaders, Pilate, they heard the words of Jesus. They heard the word of God, but that didn't turn them away from deciding godliness. But the words of the, what the, the pleasures of the eyes were even more powerful for these people in power than the words of God. So that's one thing that sometimes we get frustrated with people in power. We get frustrated with presidents and governors and, and people in power. But one thing I ask sometimes is, if I see a dirt bird, will I complain and get frustrated for that dead bird not to fly? Why will I get so upset with a dirt bird? Because he's not flying. How can I expect someone who is in sin to fly? How can I expect someone who is in sin to behave Jesus-like if they are not even with Jesus? Why will I get, I mean, it's okay to get frustrated with Herod, but the thing is, Herod is not in Christ. Herod is not following Christ. Herod is turning down the word of God. And the word of God teaches us in Romans 6, 23, that he is dead. That the, the death of sin is, uh, is dead. That's what they owe and that's what they are. In, they are dead in their sins, in their trespasses. And we were as well. Whenever we are not in Christ Jesus, we are dead. And we cannot expect a fleshly man to turn and do spiritual things. The spiritual things are, are this for the spiritual person who has been resurrected in the waters of baptism and has received a new life and has been cleansed and now has the Spirit of God living in him or her. And now they are able to live according to God's word. The, mood, the veil has been removed. And now we are called to live up to God's standards and how Jesus lived. But when we are not following Jesus, then there is nothing to expect because the, all there is is death. Herod and Tipa's interest and his commitment, his power and his pleasure, all of these areas were on the side of the world. He shows woman's mystery, Salome, he committed himself to the world not to God. He feared men and not God. He gave himself to pleasure and abstained himself from God. So you see the contrast between the decisions he made, which were giving himself into seduction and turning away from God. And that's a decision we all make every day. I, you know, if you ask me, I regret that when I, before I came here, I was on my phone and I put Gilmer, Texas, and it showed one hour, three minutes. Okay, I will make it. When I put the church, then I'm, uh, it gets closer to time. And I put the Graceland Church of Christ, one hour, 25. Oh, no. <laughs> so that, I regret that. I regret it. And if you ask me, that one, this is the first time uh, I've been uh, invited to speak in a church and uh, that I get here 20 minutes late. So <laughs> it's a record. And I, I regret that. And, but what does my regret do? Any, does, it doesn't help me at all. So the, it, sed, uh, seduction takes over and time. And those are some spots that will never be cleansed. They are marked in history. And uh, when we decide for God the life that is in God, there are no regrets in God's way. There are no regrets. That's the great news. And that's one thing we encourage college students constantly. They call, in college, you can make so many decisions that you will regret the rest of your life. Uh, there are so many stories. So, but in Christ Jesus, you can go through your entire college with no regrets. That's a great, those are great news, actually. So, um, if you are here today and you would like to give yourself to Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, I invite you to come forward as we stand and sing. And sing.